right. Okay, so hi everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Today we have some really great presentations from our University of Utah fourth year medical students. Um, and then um, these are students are currently rotating with us. To be respectful of everybody's time, I'm just going to give everybody maybe like a 30 second to one minute warning if you're kind of coming up to the 10 minute mark. And then we'll have an additional five minutes for everybody for questions. Uh, so to start off, we have Caitlin Cooper. She is from Minnesota and currently on the neuro-ophthalmology rotation. Something interesting about Caitlin is that she recently hiked through the Peekaboo and Spooky Slot Canyons in Southern Utah. And the heat of so Southern Utah was turned to be a very eventful trip and ended up uh, ended with her party having to call the search and rescue. So definitely ask her about uh, that the next time you see her. Her presentation is titled Virtual Reality as a Screening Mechanism for Glaucoma. So take it away, Caitlin. Thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Hu. Um, let me share the screen quickly. Okay. All right, I am so excited to speak with you guys today um, and discuss glaucoma screening. Um, oh no. Okay, it's working. Uh, so what I'm discussing is a clinical research study that was designed by Dr. Olson, Dr. Dr. Simpson, and myself that we've been working on for the last two and a half years. Um, oh, there we go. So as far as financial disclosures, I have none. Um, so I'd just like to start by saying that I am intimidated to be speaking on glaucoma in front of a group where every single person on this call is definitely more of an expert than I am. So bear with me. We'll start from the basics. Primary open angle glaucoma prevalence is 2.85% um, in a population of 50 plus. The incidence is 0 0.38. Uh, per 100 person years at 50 plus, and the population is 44.7 million worldwide. Um, when discussing screening for glaucoma, right now the USPSTF recommendations is that you don't do it. Um, the studies that they looked at to make these recommendations were a combination of IOP, visual fields, and fundus exams. Those were what were used for screening. And they said most tests that are available in a primary care setting do not have acceptable accuracy to detect glaucoma. And of course, when we talk about most tests available in a primary care setting, uh, we're talking about a tone of pen, a rudimentary fundus exam, and visual fields by confrontation. They stated that the evidence of effectiveness of screening for glaucoma on clinical outcomes is lacking and that the balance of benefits and harms therefore cannot be determined. They noted that early screening and treatment might help to prevent small visual field de defects but were not clinically detected by the patients but no huge outcomes on vision overall. So why should we care about screening? I'm going to kind of go from here and build a case for glaucoma screening. First study I want to talk about is the early manifest glaucoma trial, 255 patients with primary open angle glaucoma that was already diagnosed. Uh, two groups, uh, one, they received trabeculoplasty and betaxolol, the second, no treatment. Over six years, they were followed up every three months, and there was a 53% progression rate when you look at visual fields. Um, at the end of the study, they noted that the treatment group had half the disease progression as compared to the control group. So that's great for early glau glaucoma treatment, but why would we want to find and treat glaucoma suspect patients before they develop glaucoma? So second study that I'm going to talk about, ocular hypertension treatment study, 1,636 patients that did not have primary open angle glaucoma at the beginning of the study did have ocular hypertension. There were two groups. Uh, one was treated with ocular hypotensives, the other one with no treatment. They were followed for an average of 60 months, every six, every six months, excuse me. And uh, there was a 7% progression rate to glaucoma in this group. So what's cool about this study is that the treatment group had less than half the rate of progression to glaucoma as compared to the control group. It was a 0.4 hazard ratio with a 95% confidence interval of 0.27 to 0.59 and a P of less than 0.001. So while you could argue that perhaps the number needed to treat, since considering we're talking about 1,636 patients, right? Uh, the number needed to treat might be um, pretty high, so it might not be super clinically significant, although I do believe it is, but you might argue that, but you definitely couldn't argue that this isn't a statistically significant study. Um, so, 
why not use IOP for screening then? So next study that I want to talk about um, is a Swedish DRIVE model. There are 32,918 subjects that they looked over 10 years to create a prediction model based off of age and IOP alone. The IOP cutoff that they used for this study was 25 millimeters mercury. There were 406 glaucoma diagnoses in this time in this population. 57% of these diagnoses had an IOP of less than or equal to 21. So they found with this model that they created that they had a 32% sensitivity with a 99% specificity. So it was great at, um, in the fact that it had very few false positives, but a lot of missed cases. In fact, there are a lot of missed cases of glaucoma worldwide. There it was a, a meta-analysis done that they estimated that out of the glaucoma population, greater than 50% of them were undiagnosed. And um, specifically, they did one in Thessaloniki, Greece, where it was 57% what they found. And these are in developed countries. And I know the map has Italy. I just didn't know how to change the figure. Um, so that kind of brings me, hopefully I've kind of built this case here for why screening might be important. So that brings me to the, um, the screening test that was developed. So this was developed by Dr. Kideri, who as I understand did his residency here at the University of Utah, and Jonathan Olson and Dr. Kyle McDermott, who works in the company that Dr. Kideri started. Um, and in discussing with them, what they considered important in this screening test that they were developing through virtual reality for glaucoma. These are the characteristics that they thought were important. The first one was a detection of visual field defects, kind of obvious, right? Also contrast sensitivity, velocity sensitivity, and that it was less uncomfortable and time intensive than Humphrey, right? Um, so this video that I took of myself because of COVID and I don't really have any friends anymore. So this video you can see putting on the headset and um, it's not too bulky, not very uncomfortable, pretty easy to adjust to different patient settings. Um, that piece in the front gives a 120 degree field view um, and what I'm looking at in the is kind of targets and I'm targeting them with my vision. Um, if I were to stand up and turn around, I would have a 360 degree view, almost like a sphere, right? This was the first time I'd done virtual reality was this game. So just kind of explain it for anyone like me who has never done it before. Um, what the patient sees, so when you put this headset on, this is the first screen that you come to. Um, this is kind of the instruction screen and right over target, you'll see a hollow circle. That hollow circle is my visual target. So that represents the center of my vision right now. It's right on the horizontal meridian, right in the center of the screen. As I move my head, that circle moves with my head. Um, I use that circle to target different objects. So right here you see the, this circle with a cross on it. And that is when I rest my vision on it for a second or two, it blips and, and goes out of screen and you move on to the next portion of the game. So here's an example of one of the screens that you would see on the game. You see one circle with the cross on it and then the other circles don't and they're moving, they move at different velocities. So this gives you velocity and contrast sensitivity. And as you keep playing the game, um, the Contrast changes, so it becomes harder and harder to distinguish the one circle with the cross on it from the other circles. Um, and then oh, later on in the game, um, there is kind of an X in the middle of your screen and you keep your target right on that X. And from your peripheral vision, a circle will start to come in. And as soon as you see it, you move your head to target it. So that's how the um, visual fields are. Um, testing and again, that's 120 degrees of visual field testing. So study design, we have three patient groups, a control group with no evidence of glaucoma, a glaucoma suspect group, and this is uh, through chart search, the patients that were actively being managed as glaucoma suspect, and then uh, the glaucoma group, uh, and specifically looking at primary open angle glaucoma. The measures that um, we, all the patients needed to have a current in the last six months, um, IOP for both eyes, OCT, RNFL, and Humphrey visual fields. So inclusion criteria, 
um, be, based off of the initial data that um, Dr. Kaderi and his team collected, um, we kept our inclusion criteria from 40 to 70, and that was just for the IRB and statistical analysis because that was the initial data that we had, and then a visual acuity of 20 over 40 or better. For exclusion criteria, the first one was extensive video gameplay. Uh, we arbitrarily set a limit of five hours per week for extensive video gameplay, which probably unsurprisingly was not an issue in this age group and population. And that's an interesting point is that the data that we're collecting probably would only be accurate for this generation or this group of people because once you have extensive video gameplay, that probably does change your parameters of what you would consider, you know, a cutoff or sensitivity um, specificity. Uh, we also excluded prosthetic eye or unilateral vision. We excluded pregnant women, which again has not been an issue in this age group, and individuals with corneal or optic nerve pathology or retinal dystrophy. As far as um, so just this is just kind of a side note. Doctors Olson and Simpson are incredible because as I was chart searching, I would see these uh, these diagnoses and uh, I wasn't quite sure, you know, if these would affect the study or not. So I would just keep this running tally of diagnoses and then text or email them every couple of days and they were so nice. And this is kind of this running list. You can see that they got a lot of text and emails. These are the acceptable and these are the unacceptable comorbidities. Risk for the study, um, you, there's a slight risk of nausea of playing virtual reality. And apart from that, there weren't really any other uh, risks that we could think of to put on the R IRB. Uh, so for preliminary data, there aren't enough patients enrolled to say how, um, how good this screening model is. But I can say that I've had the glowing commendation of it is way better than the blinking light test. So the patients don't hate it as much as they hate the visual fields. As far as next steps for this test or for this um, study, uh, really manpower since third year started and fourth year is kind of shaping up to be pretty similar. I haven't had a lot of office hours to devote to this study um, when I could be recruiting patients. So if you guys get any emails of medical students or pre-med students or anyone that's um, looking for a project, send them my way. This is super awesome, a very fun project to work on. So my references, huge thanks to Dr. Olson and Simpson, to the fourth floor research team and all the techs and doctors who let me steal their patients before they were dilated. Uh, do you guys have any ideas, any questions about this study? Awesome. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, right now we'll open it up to questions. You can feel free to raise your hand or and we can unmute you or even throw in some chat questions. All right. Um, well, we'll just move along. And if there are any questions, of course, for Caitlin, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and we can also go back. Um, our next presenter is uh, William West. He is from Sandy, Utah and went to BYU for undergrad. Uh, we've had some fun seeing kids in pediatric ophthalmology with Dr. Jardine during his rotation. Uh, his hobbies include climbing, water sports, and quilting. You can think that last one to coronavirus. Uh, and he is presenting a case report on unilateral epitheliopathy after LASIK. So we'll get him up on the screen, perfect. Okay, let me get my screen shared here. So I appreciate the opportunity to share this case uh, that we were able to see in corneal clinic. Uh, we saw a case of unilateral epitheliopathy after. so good. And your slides were so cool. Um, the case consists of a 36-year-old male who returned to our corneal clinic, um, was referred to us back to our corneal clinic for epitheliopathy about six months after we performed a, an uncomplicated LASIK procedure bilaterally for correction of myopia. The patient complained of worsening vision in, in his left eye exclusively, as well as an increasing sense of irritation and foreign body sensation. Um, his past medical history was negative for 
um, any trauma to the eye. However, he did have a history of redness and episodic irritation in the left eye. Uh, he had also been diagnosed with a single episode of contact lens induced um, keratitis that was seen to affect just the superior aspect of the cornea. He denies any family history of ocular disorders. Um, he was seen during the interim period in the first six months of his LASIK recovery by his local optometrist. And we had no follow up with the patient until he returned via referral for this epitheliopathy. Two weeks, in the two weeks following the LASIK procedure, he was seen to have perfect vision with no complications, um, with a visual acuity in both eyes of 20 over 15. At one month, however, he returned to clinic with a sense of irritation and a slight loss of vision. He was seen at that time to have a visual acuity in the left eye of 20 over 30, while the right eye continued to have a visual acuity of 20 over 15. Um, on physical exam at that time, a, a plaque was seen to develop from the superior aspect of the cornea. Um, and a three week taper of prednisone was started for presumed interface inter inflammation. The prednisone gave him symptomatic relief only without improving his visual acuity or the appearance of the plaque. At four months, the plaque was seen to have grown significantly and now involved the superior aspect of the LASIK flap. Um, at that time, a second trial of steroids were performed and again gave symptomatic relief only. From the period of four months to six months, the, the plaque continued to grow and a second plaque was seen to develop from the inferior aspect of the cornea. In both cases, the plaques started at the limbus and moved progressively toward the uh, visual axis. At the time of the development of the second plaque, the patient was referred back to us for exam. Um, the patient denied any trauma or chemical exposure between his LASIK procedure and when we saw him back in clinic. However, on careful questioning, he was found to have a history of Accutane use as a young man, as well as a possible history of battery acid uh, exposure to the left eye when he was a young child after a battery exploded. Um, this was not seen by uh, any medical provider at that time and never caused him any problems that he knew of. He also had a history of military service with work around chemicals, however, no direct contact with those chemicals. And as a hobby, he performed, uh, he, he was a barbecuer and um, brewed his own alcohol, but again, denies any thermal or chemical exposure. The physical exam is pictured here with a well demarcated wave-like coarse plaque progressing from the superior limbus and inferior limbus. Both of these plaques were seen to involve the LASIK flap um, without any invasion underneath the flap. The flap additionally was well approximated without any sign of dislocation or interruption. A sub-epithelial sub haze was visible and on fluorescein staining, a punctate staining pattern was seen. There was also slight injection in the superior conjunctiva. For our differential diagnosis, we included epithelial ingrowth, diffuse lamellar keratitis, and central toxic keratopathy as likely in the period surrounding his LASIK procedure. These were considered with a grain of salt, however, because of the lack of any invasion of epithelial cells underneath the LASIK flap as well as the lack of visible white blood cells in the corneal stroma. Um, additionally, this pathology that we saw progressed from the limbus, whereas these three diseases tend to initiate and grow from the LASIK flap edges itself. Um, we also considered limbal stem cell deficiency to be very likely as the limbus was the source of the beginning of this plaque. Um, and we also considered OSSN and CIN as necessary parts of our differential. These were less likely in the context of recent LASIK surgery being so closely related to the development of the pathology. 
Um, other considerations included Accutane associated keratopathy, also somewhat less likely due to the um, distant past of only six months worth of Accutane use and knowing that Accutane keratitis tends to resolve after cessation of the, the drug. Herpes keratitis was also considered, but also less likely due to the lack of a branching pattern in the plaque and to, due to the fact that it did not get any worse with the use of steroids. A diagnosis of advancing wave-like epitheliopathy was made. This is a subcategory of partial limbal stem cell deficiency. In the normal eye, the limbal stem cells are responsible for the generation of healthy epithelium that covers the cornea. In a limbal stem cell deficiency, the balance, the delicate balance that maintains these epithelial cells and the, the growth of the corneal epithelium is disrupted. This results in neovascularization and inflammation and often causes conjunctival invasion of the cornea as is seen in these photos. Um, in this case, in advancing wave-like epitheliopathy, this is considered likely to be a, an unusual presentation of limbal stem cell deficiency, whereas normally we would see this corneal conjunctivalization, we instead see the normal growth pattern of epithelium with unusual abnormal epithelial cells, creating the wave-like plaque for which the pathology is named. Um, this, uh, any limb limbal stem cell deficiency is known to be caused by trauma or irritation or toxic exposure to the limbus itself and can be partial or complete depending on the extent of the damage to the limbus. Um, uh, patients tend to present with the classic wave-like appearance of, of this plaque that was shown earlier. And classically, it starts at the superior limbus. Um, there are also cases of this plaque being caused by contact lens use or topical medications. The, in addition to the classic appearance of the physical exam here, the diagnosis was considered much more likely and made due to the multiple chemical and toxic exposures in addition to LASIK that this patient had. Um, the patient also had contact lens history, which made the diagnosis much more likely. Um, in management of advancing wave-like epitheliopathy, we, we focus first on maximizing the ability of the cornea to heal itself as well as to uh, minimize infl inflammation of the cornea. Often, however, these, these interventions have been seen to be ineffective. Surgical management shows more promising results with superficial keratectomy or corneal epithelial debridement. This tends to give temporary re relief with initial regrowth of smooth epithelium, however, almost universal recurrence of the pathology. Use of silver nitrate in addition to epithelial debridement has been known to prevent the recurrence of the pathology. Other things that have been tried include um, topical interferon, vitamin A, and topical cyclosporin. These all have been used in other limbal stem cell pathologies. However, the data is poor in this pathology. Uh, limbal stem cell transplant can also be effective. In our specific case, we first attempted uh, medical management, which classically was ineffective. We then tried corneal epithelial debridement with, with again, classic results, initial success followed by recurrence of the pathology. The patient has been on a, a three-month topical interferon trial with vitamin A, and has seen some improvement. His visual acuity is now 20 over 50, where it was at worst at 20 over 80. Um, our plan going forward is to attempt a, a simple limbal stem cell transplant. However, the patient is currently resistant to that course of action.
So takeaway points for advancing wave-like epitheliopathy. Um, it is a partial limbal stem cell deficiency that results in this classic plaque um, and wave-like pattern, often progressing from the superior limbus. Treatment consists of medical therapy first, attempting to minimize inflammation, followed by surgery with silver nitrate causing the most durable results. Um, these are the sources that I used to research this pathology, and I would like to thank my mentors, Dr. Majid Moshefar and Dr. Griffin Jardine. Um, are there any questions that anybody has about this pathology? I have a question. Thank you for the presentation. That was uh, excellent. So for, for anyone that doesn't know SLET, uh, that acronym, that is uh, where you, you take from the fellow eye some of the, the limbal stem cells, and, and thankfully you don't have to take a lot. You actually just cut them up into small pieces and then distribute them around the limbus. Uh, anyone from cornea, correct me if I've uh, led anyone in error. And the question I had in, in your review, had you uh, come across any, any allogenic limbal cell, I'm sorry, um, uh, limbal cell transplants from the uh, fellow eye that then cause limbal insufficiency in the eye, the, the donor eye. Again, I, I would assume that this would you know, run together if you've got some level of limbal stem cell insufficiency in one eye that you'd potentially have some in the other. That's certainly always a risk with this uh, pathology. Clearly the patient is predisposed to having a, a limbal stem cell deficiency. In this case, this would be a case where um, those concerns would be slightly less due to the history of a unilateral battery acid exposure as a kid, as well as um, preoperatively, this patient complained of recurrent irritation in the left eye only. Um, had this patient consented to moving forward with a simple limbal stem cell transplant, we likely would have been very comfortable um, proceeding with that procedure, knowing that the same symptoms weren't present in that right eye. But it's certainly always a risk and can definitely occur with removal of limbal stem cells from the opposite eye. Great. Any, any other questions? Okay, and of course, if anybody thinks of any, we can put them in the chat window. Um, and so we'll probably move on to our uh, last presenter. So last but not least, we have Rhett Thompson. He is from Spanish Fork, Utah. He majored in uh, American Sign Language in undergrad at Utah Valley University. And something interesting about Rhett is that he took a leave of absence during medical school to create a medical education company called physio.com. And today he is print, uh, presenting on deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. So Rhett, take it away. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Hu. <clears throat> so am, are you seeing my screen? Just wanna make sure. Yeah, we are. Cool, okay. So I'm really thankful to be here and I'm gonna be talking about a dunk, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. So interestingly, the first successful cornea transplant was reported in 1905 by Dr. Edward Zerb. Just think it's an interesting fact. And we've come a long way since then. And right now in the modern day, there's two broad categories of corneal transplants. There's the full thickness penetrating keratoplasty, which you know, most of us are familiar with, PK. And then there's a partial thickness lamellar keratoplasty. It's uh, just another category. And some of the more familiar ones, uh, some of the conditions um, that you're usually going to treat with a lamellar keratoplasty or a partial thickness keratoplasty would be something like Fuchs dystrophy, in which is just a, like a posterior pathology. And this would be often treated with a DSEC or a DMEC. Now when it comes to anterior pathology, that's where the deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty comes in to play. So let's dive into that now. So a DALC is a condition, a, a DALC is a procedure in which you remove the native epithelium, the Bowman's layer and the stroma. 
and you leave behind Desimase membrane and the endothelial cell layer. So if you look at this image on the right, you can see a space between you know, the inferior stroma and Desimase membrane just to kind of highlight the idea of, of what you're trying to do. You're only transplanting that top part. So the technique is in broad strokes listed here, and I, I don't want to read them all to you. I would rather explain them to you as I'm as I, we watch a video together of one of Dr. Dr. Mifflin's uh, surgeries. So this is a kind of a truncated version of the surgery. So here he's trephinating. Oh, I think you have to, uh, we, have, we can't see the video. I think you have to actually reshare your screen to that, uh, that panel. Oh, thank you so much. So here's what we'll do. So Dr. Hugh, uh -huh. I thought I would just share my, my whole screen. So is it sharing it now? Uh, I don't oh. see it, no. You don't? Okay, that's okay. I'll, I'll just explain it, I apologize. It's a, it was a good video, but I Brett, just, this is this is Dr. Petty. What you can do just briefly is unshare your screen and then reshare your screen, but select the video uh, and make sure it's optimized for video as you select. And in the meantime, I'll just um, uh, just just queue, queue up a little bit about uh, your your company just to let everyone know. So uh, this is something that Rhett created uh, to help medical students in study for their step exams. Uh, it's, uh, I, I, I'll probably get some of the stats wrong, but, but as I understand, I mean, it's really one of the you know, top one, two or three resources now utilized by medical students across the country and uh, has become widely known and a well-used resource. And now with that, I'll let you continue on. You'll probably have to do the same thing to get back to your PowerPoint. Gotcha. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dr. Petty. Um, okay, so now that we're, we're here, so this is, again, a, a truncated version of Dr. Mifflin's surgery of a successful doc, and here we've got, uh, we see the trephination, and then manual dissection of the stroma, like the top 50% or so of the stroma is what, what you'd remove, and, and you're actually going to leave the more the deeper layers of the stroma, because you want to be careful once you're getting closer to the decimated membrane. And so here you can see injecting air into the anterior chamber. And then now this is where we're introducing, or Dr. Mifflin's introducing the big bubble and using air to actually separate the remaining stroma from decimates. You create this gap that way, and it's a little bit safer. Now here's some viscoelastic that he's putting on here now, because as he's going to puncture into the, the stroma, then it creates that positive pressure where the, the decimase membrane can actually pop up and hit the instrument that you're using, which, can, which is not ideal. You don't want to damage the decimase membrane that way. And now he's dissecting the stroma, because there's enough space. It's a little bit safer now that, that there's this air gap between decimase membrane and that stroma. So, as you could see, cutting it into quadrants and then carefully dissecting that. And of course, uh, laying on the new suture and then would suture that in place. Okay, so, so that's the basic overview of how to perform a dog. Now, it's important that we understand the context of, of a dog in the current environment because PK or penetrating keratoplasty is typically what's done in order to treat anterior pathologies, even in 
a situation in which you could potentially use a dog. So my only point in making this is that, uh, the only point I'm trying to make here is that a dog is really compared, and the outcomes of a dog are compared against a PK. So um, the reasons that a PK might be more commonly used than a dog is that the PK is well established. It's a very, the steps and the procedure is very well established and there's decades of research supporting its use. And also with a dog, it's actually difficult, at least historically, to manually dissect, dissect off the stroma and leave behind uniform tissue. If you can't achieve that, then it, there's poor visual outcomes. And so a PK is, is typically has been used. And also, it's technically challenging in the sense that it's really easy to puncture Decimase membrane. So I wanna dive into this idea a little bit more. So this on the right, you can see an image just taken from a, a snapshot of that video I showed you. And I want you to appreciate just those anterior chamber bubbles that were injected and how it really highlights this superficial or how thin this Decimase membrane is. And, and it's so easy to puncture. And so there's actually evidence that it's been punctured at several different steps during the surgery, like from the beginning with trepanation and even at the end when you're just suturing on the, the donor graft. So traditionally, when there is, when this occurs, when there's a decimase membrane puncture, the surgeon would just convert to a PK. And that's, and that's still what's typically done. Uh, what I want to point out is that there's a couple studies that I found in which a in which the surgeon actually used a more conservative measure like fibrin glue or something and then proceeded with the surgery as normal and didn't convert to a PK and so in those outcomes were actually compared to situations in which a dog was performed as normal without any puncture and it looks so far that the the outcomes were similar, which is which is good. Um, so a more conservative treatment, if you end up puncturing Dustamase membrane, may be appropriate. But but the basic idea is that you would generally convert to a PK. So having said all of that, there are some advantages to a dock over a PK. And the biggest thing to keep in mind is that there would be decreased risk of graft rejection. And that makes sense because the endothelial layer in a corneal graft is usually the target of host immune attack. And if you're not transplanting a foreign endothelial layer, then graft rejection overall, it's very, very much decreased. And so the patients that you wanna be thinking about would be young patients in whom you would expect to have a high immune response. So, so a young, otherwise healthy patient would be a good candidate for a dog. Um, now, there's evidence, there's some evidence that the wound is potentially a little bit, a little bit stronger with a dog, um, which may be helpful in trauma patients. It's not super clear yet with, uh, you know, whether or not that's, that will hold true. The evidence is, is not necessarily robust for that idea. But something really interesting is that a dog can be performed successfully, even with lower quality graphs. So this can be really useful in, in situations or even areas in which a hospital doesn't have access to healthy tissue readily. And so in those situations, they may have access to, you know, just the anterior layers of the, of the cornea. So, um, and sometimes eye banks will actually even donate these uh, uh, eyes, which can be helpful. And at least no situations can lower the cost of the surgery. Now, this is, a patient, this is a picture taken from a patient last week, and this is a post-op dog patient of Dr. Mifflin's, and I want you to appreciate the neovascularization that's coming in, especially superiorly, and if you can follow that along, you can see just how far down it, it descends, and so I, I want to point this out because, yes, there is decreased endothelial graft rejection, uh, but you know, things like this can still occur. Um, so that was just an interesting patient case there. Um, you know, there was a lot of studies that have a lot to say on 
comparing Dalks and PK. And the one that I liked the most was actually the most recent and it was performed, it was published earlier this year. It's a systematic review and meta-analysis. And in that study, they, they included 530 Dalk surgeries and 560 PKs. And the visual outcomes overall were comparable between the two. And then the graft rejection risk was, as you would expect, lower overall with a DALK. And then the complication overall was also decreased with a DALK, with DALK surgeries. And this is uh, it's the end of my presentation. And here are some of the references. Um, here's some more references. And I just want to give a special, uh, just want to thank Dr. Mifflin for his help with this. And uh, Dr. Petty, I want to thank you for uh, covering for me during that awkward moment, which I was trying to get my screen to work. It was uh, <laughs> helped me a lot. So thank you. Great job, Brett. Um, and then we also have a question from um, faculty. It just says iPhone, so I'm actually not sure wh who, where this question came from. Uh, but it just says, can Rhett repeat what he was saying about another method using fibrin glue? Um, they didn't quite catch that part. If you could. You bet. So, so yeah, so there's evidence that fibrin glue, there's some several other more conservative measures as well that, that some surgeons, I guess, experimented with. This was in uh, the Middle East. And they were able to, so, so in that situation, they punctured the desmase membrane. And instead of converting to a full PK, which you might expect, they actually used fibrin glue and just tried to, to restore the cohesion of the desmase membrane. And then they just proceeded with the surgery as normal. And there were there was a five five case studies that they studied, and each one of them, according to their reports, actually had the same visual outcomes when compared to uh, dolks that proceeded as normal without any puncture in desmase membrane. So that so the idea that I was trying to make is that, uh, or the point I was trying to make is that that is potentially a way to proceed in the surgery, um, even though that's not really commonly done, and, and traditionally you just move to a full PK. Hope that answers the question. So, Rhett, I don't know if you'll be able to answer that. And Ethan, you may need to keep an eye to see if any of the other cornea faculty can answer this. So, uh, having uh, trained a lot of residents, I, I've seen a number of uh, decimase membrane tears, significant tears. I even had a case uh, in, in an outreach setting where I personally had uh, a small tear. And when I put some viscoelastic back into the eye to, to check something that looked odd, I actually managed to completely separate decimase membrane from the rest of the cornea with viscoelastic. Uh, patient did well uh, in the end, but it took me a minute to figure out what exactly had happened. It does seem like decimase is a lot more uh, resilient than perhaps we initially thought. And I'd just be curious if uh, in, in you know our cornea um, our cornea faculties practice, they feel like in the future, in these, you know, really technically difficult surgeries, Mark, you made it look easy. If again, with these, you know, tears that invariably will happen, if, if you think we're going to more and more continue to just proceed with a uh, DALC rather than conversion to PK. So I think that's a good question. And I, um, I'll defer to you know, professionals who who have more practical experience with this. Um, but I can say that I was only able to find two studies that really examined that, and they were minimal um, in, in their sample size. I don't know if, um, yeah. Any, cool. Great. We'll uh, unmute you, Brian. Brian Zog has a comment. We'll, we'll unmute you here and have a sec, Brian. Good to go, Dr. Zog. Possibly. Am I unmuted now? There we go. We can hear you. Sorry. I thought I was unmuted, and then I'm not. Okay. So in some of those cases where you have like a really small decimase tear um, when you're trying to do a DALC, um, you can actually continue it. Um, the challenge is, is that once you commit to a DALC, then you're stuck because you take your donor tissue 
and you actually destroy or wipe off Decimase membrane. Um, and then you essentially put that on top of the host Decimase membrane and suture it in place. And so in our situation in the US, if I am concerned that I've torn Decimase membrane and I don't feel like I can keep it in place, which sometimes you can do with an air bubble after you've sutured on your PK, then I'm just gonna do a PK because I know I've got really good tissue with endothelium that's very healthy. In other countries, so where this kind of fiber and glue idea came in is, they may not have tissue that is viable for a PK. So their only option when they're doing that surgery is to do a dowel. And so if they rupture Decimase, host Decimase membrane, they don't have tissue that is healthy enough to do a PK. And so they're just, they've got to do, make do with what they have. And so in some of those situations, they'll just try to reattach Decimase once they kind of suture on that dowel tissue. So we're pretty lucky in the U.S. that in most cases, surgeons will just convert to a PK if they're concerned, whereas in other countries, they may not have that option because of tissue availability. And there's some really cool things that are happening with this where they'll take, they'll take tissue that's PK worthy and they'll actually strip off endothelium and do a DMEC or, a, or even a DSEC on a patient. And then they'll use that anterior lamellar, essentially donor tissue to do a DALC. And so they're kind of splitting one donor cornea into two different surgeries to help patients with different pathologies. So kind of different situations where that might come up, but for us, it's usually just go on to PK. Great, thank you, Dr. Zog. Um, does anybody have any other questions for Rhett? Uh, otherwise, we also did want to circle back to a question for Caitlin. Um, so this was from Dr. Petty. It said, uh, a question we can come back to at the end, but how would you design a study that you could evaluate a subject's experience with gaming? Um, young, healthy gamers will likely score higher than older, healthy non-gamers. Hey, yeah, so this is actually a thought that I've been kind of ruminating on for a couple of years now. Um, I think it would be very tricky. I think in 20, 30 years, it will be a lot easier because we would have video gamers in this age range that have been playing since they were little. Um, right now, even in the 40 to 70 year old age range, the people who have been playing for 20 years, I'm, I would hypothesize that they're Gameplay is fundamentally different from someone who started playing when they were five or six versus someone who played, started playing when they were 20 or 30. Um, so I think it would be super hard. I think you, the best that you could do is um, kind of start with an age group and then study gamers versus non-gamers or start with gamers versus non-gamers and then try to, uh, I mean, uh, allow for age, try to create a model for age. I'm not, 100% sure how it would work. Well, thank you for that. No, it, it is really tough. I do wonder if, you know, in a, in a large enough study, you, you could use a multivariate analysis and then, you know, te tease that out in the end, um, you know, because it, you know, in certainly that there will be a learning curve, right? And, and we even know that with just typical visual fields, there's a learning curve for those who have done them uh, for a number of years versus those who are just starting uh, but this, uh, you know, thinking about this as a screening device, uh, you know, I, th I think that'll be an interesting uh, element, you know, what thresholds are you putting? Are you perhaps eventually having a different threshold depending on, you know, the amount of, you know, gaming experience if that really does play out as something significant? And I mean, since it is such a like a complex system, um, they can build algorithms in. So, I mean, the patient, the first thing that they do is they say, this is my age, these are my comorbidities. And I, I do think that eventually the algorithms, the AI learning models could account for all of that, which is probably take an end of much higher than what I'm doing with this study. And then final question, are the games fun, uh, fun enough that people would actually just play them and perhaps auto screen themselves as they're playing a fun game? I will say no, but okay, here's, there's a no, but so this game that was developed, this was kind of, this was developed specifically for glaucoma screening and uh, kind of less time was put into this game than the other games that Dr. Kaderi developed. I played those ones. Those ones I would play for just fun. This one, no. <laughs> All 
All right, well, great job everybody to all our presenters today. Um, I think if there are no other questions, we'll wrap up here and we'll see you guys all next week. Mm -hmm.